Hi, Ilya. Really nice to have you here today. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, so, Tajikistan is one of the most poorest uh, Central Asian countries and it's been under the dictatorship of President Rahman. Uh, the recent OCCRP discovery uh, has shown that all the corruption ties go to the family of the president. So, can you tell us exactly how bad it is? Well, it's really bad. I think this is uh, basically has been known that the country of Tajikistan is under the rule of this president and his family and that they take everything, every business that grows above a certain point, they take it for themselves. I think what our investigation shows is the mechanisms, some of the mechanisms behind how this works. And basically, it's a very sad situation. It removes any incentives for local people to try to grow their business, to uh, build something big. It makes them want to leave. Some, many go to Russia, many go to Turkey or other countries, because if you remain in the country, anything any business that you build will eventually be seen and then swiped by the some member of the ruling family. And in the case of our story, we focused on the son-in-law of the president, a man named Shamsullah Sahibov, who married one of the president's daughters and then built a business empire. And we show how he built that empire step by step with assistance of various kinds from the government. And we also show the fates of some of the people who either stood in his way or tried to uh, tried to point the way towards a different kind of Tajikistan. So it's really a story both about corruption and about um, growing wealth through using the power of the state. It's also a story about foreign involvement in, this, in these schemes, and it's a story about the victims of this kind of system. And it also has a story about why the system remains the way it is, why there's no organized political opposition. We wanted to include that too. So, in the case of Tajikistan, when like most of the people live above the power, poverty level, did you see any results of your investigation? Like, when you revealed all this information, was there any reaction from the government or the opposition, or did the Tajikistan people just awaken from the situation? Well, this came out quite recently, so I think it's probably too early to say. Uh, we were careful to uh, put a lot of energy into translating all the stories into Russian at the same time, so that when it the investigation was published in English. It was published in Russian at the same time because we want people in the country to see it. But so far, I think it's too early to say. Um, a lot of this people in the country will know to some extent already or will feel or will have some personal experience. But we've tried to do it systematically and with evidence and proof as all of our investigations require. Um, so in the long term, I think it will show not only Tajiks, but people around the world what it looks like in the modern day when a country is ruled like a kleptocracy, like a country that's basically ruled by a single family. And of course, Tajikistan is not the only country like that. You just said that uh, there is no any kind of opposition in uh, Tajikistan. So as far as I know, there was this uh, Islam Renaissance party of Tajikistan, mm -hmm. uh, which was nominally opposing the president mm -hmm. uh, through all these years. Mm -hmm. So what exactly happened to them? Well, this is a very interesting story because Tajikistan, as you mentioned, is one of the, it's the poorest former Soviet Republic, the, probably the least developed in several metrics, and very authoritarian. So it's not an environment where you would expect a really strong, robust opposition. But in fact, for a long time, uh, it had an opposition party that was maybe one of the most, I don't, want, I don't know about effective, because of course they didn't have political power, but one of the most legitimate and rooted in the grassroots of any former Soviet Republic. Many other former Soviet countries had sort of liberal, elite-based opposition parties in the 90s through today that, you know, had some support maybe in the cities among the most educated, but not really among the wide population. And this is what makes the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan different, because it really is based in, from a completely different, on a completely different foundation. Its roots are in an Islamic uh, underground movement that was started w back way, during the, way back during the Soviet era. And uh, after the civil war in Tajikistan in the 90s, it became a recognized opposition party. Uh, and it had representatives in distant villages, every region. And it was almost more like a community movement, like a religious organization, more than a sort of traditional Western political party. But it really helped people. It tried to show people that a different kind of politics was possible. That's what was interesting about it, is it was trying to show Tajikistan that there is another way to govern this country. Uh, in a way that the people can help determine their own future. But in 2015, uh, after several years of gradually tightening repression, eventually 
uh, when the party opposed uh, some proposed constitutional changes that would make the president above the constitution, uh, it was shut down. And in a matter of months in that year, it was just uh, through arrests, through intimidation, through torture, through exile, the whole structure was dismantled. And today, its former activists are across the world, living in different countries. They have political asylum in various European countries. And those that weren't able to escape or remained in the country for whatever reason, most have been imprisoned. And so the party's activities basically shut down. And that the reason we wanted to include that story in this investigation is to show how can a regime that steals from its own people like this, that takes everything over from its own people, how does it survive? And this is the reason, because it uses repression to crush any effective opposition. I would like to address one of the most recent and brutal cases uh, with the opposition leaders, such as uh, Umar Likovatov, mm -hmm. who was brutally murdered, shot uh, in the streets of Istanbul. Like, mm -hmm. why do you think he was so dangerous uh, for Tajikistan that they just approached him abroad in exile? Well, I want to say that we don't know exactly who killed him. Uh, his supporters, his family, they very strongly insist that it was some representatives of the regime. It's hard to say exactly who may have ordered it or what. But yes, he was pursued across the world after being chased out of Tajikistan. Uh, he was imprisoned several times at the request of the Tajik government. The Tajik government, as you say, came out very strongly against him. And I think it's because they really just are that frightened of a vo uh, loud opposition voice that tells people the truth. And he, while he was abroad, after leaving the country, he uh, was very vocal in, he bought time on television while he was in Russia and he tried to get, uh, and he put videos on YouTube and he tried to get his opposition to the regime into Tajikistan. There's a great little anecdote that we include in one of the stories. Uh, a, w a Western researcher was in Tajikistan and his cleaning, his cleaning lady was in the apartment and sent on the TV a program by Umar Ali Kuvatov came on where he was talking about you know, the authoritarianism of the president and how the president is leading the country in the wrong direction. And she, he remembers that the cleaning lady froze. And for her, it was like seeing God criticized on TV for the first time. This is the environment that has been built in Tajikistan. It's um, the leader of the Islamic Renaissance Party uh, told me that it was like, it's like North Korea. You know, people only see that Tajikistan is safe. The president keeps you safe. Everywhere else in the world is chaos. Uh, everywhere else with religious opposition parties, Islamic parties, is just terrorism and extremism here in Tajikistan. It's everything is different. So to have that little crack into that facade that Umar Ali Kuvatov tried to provide uh, was very threatening for the regime and that's why they came after him, I think. So till these days, uh, Tajikistan is a part of uh, OSCE and uh, it's also in the program of EU partnership. So if it's really turning into North Korea, as you said, do you think the Western governments should act somehow to stop this process or how is it possible that the country that is so that is becoming so close and uh, so authoritarian is still a part of the western values well this is a great question i'm not sure the western governments can do all that much about what happens inside tajikistan but certainly one thing they could do is stop legitimizing the government as a legitimate uh, you know, member of the international community on the same level as other much more democratic countries. Uh, the human rights abuses we point to in our stories and the economic crimes, I mean all kinds of crimes that take place there are so completely blatant and so outrageous that it really should be something that Western governments are speaking about when they speak to Tajikistan and when they speak about Tajikistan. As you mentioned, though, it's uh, you know an upstanding member of these Western organizations, and I think uh, often Western governments are reluctant to um, criticize a quote-unquote friendly dictator. You know, Tajikistan is small; it's far away. Not a lot of people really take up the cause of Tajikistan in the West. Most people don't know that much about it, so I think that's why it's sort of that's why we have that situation that Western governments feel free to collaborate with the government to treat it maybe not as an equal but as a legitimate partner and the people of Tajikistan who suffer under this regime uh, I think it's hard for them to understand. During this investigation of yours how hard was it for you to uh, to work in Tajikistan to obtain some information and did you ever feel that you were in danger? Well I didn't go there personally and most of our uh, called my colleagues who worked on the story were not able to be in the country. We did rely on some reporters in the country who we don't name to protect their safety. But a lot of the reporting for these investigations, uh, unlike many of our investigations, which are based on documents, business registry, 
uh, files, some kind of leaks or some kind of documentary proof. It's very hard to find those kinds of things in Tajikistan because it's so closed. You know, even citizens inside the country who try to access the business registry sometimes find that they're questioned by the security services. Uh, so in this case, it relied a lot on interviews with uh, people from the country, with people who interacted with them, with this, uh, you know, we interviewed uh, the, West, the mining executive who paid a so-called success fee to a company belonging to the son-in-law of the president in order to try to obtain a mining license. And we could see the uh, files of that company because it's registered on the London Alternative Stock Exchange and it's you know a Western company, so it has some requirements for publishing things. So we kind of have to work around the fact that Tajikistan is really one of the most secretive countries and really one of the most difficult countries in the world to report from. That's why this project was such an enormous effort and took such a long time to pull together. But I think uh, it's worth doing because I think uh, you know the darkest corners in the world should have light um, thrown upon them, and that's uh, one of the missions of our organization. What do you think should happen in Tajikistan? Because the situation that is in Tajikistan is not uh, the unique one. We have the same thing uh, with the presidential family in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And we had the same situation of kleptocracy in Ukraine. Uh, but mm -hmm. Ukrainian people decided to uh, rebel all this uh, um, corruption and mm -hmm. uh, power within the hands of one family. So what should happen in Tajikistan to, to stop all these processes of closing and even more corruption? That's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. I think that, um, you know, a few years ago I would have said maybe the Islamic Renaissance Party would have had a chance of starting to build some kind of movement against corruption, but unfortunately they were very brutally repressed. Um, so right now it's hard to imagine what could change the country. The president will not live forever, even though he evidently wants to, judging by his titles. Uh, it looks like he's grooming his son to succeed him. So it looks like he's trying to make sure that the leadership of the country stays in the family. Um, the country is undergoing a lot of challenges in its economy because it's so poorly managed and because its people are not encouraged to uh, grow you know, the economy in the same way that they can in other countries. So perhaps you know, if there's some kind of serious economic crisis, if there's some other kind of unrest, it could trigger something. But as we mentioned, you know, the country is uh, very poor and has sort of very low levels of democratic development. And in such cases, it's really hard to imagine how anything could change drastically, unfortunately. Some of the people I interviewed who have fled the country are now busy in Europe trying to build networks with other activists, trying to get the word out through social media, you know, through YouTube and those ways, and trying to get messages into the country as well. So maybe in the long term, uh, you know, the advances of sort of social media technological advances could make a difference in sort of public consciousness. Uh, but the propaganda is so strong there, the government is so powerful, and uh, as I said, the organized opposition is basically scattered. So I'm afraid it's uh, hard to imagine any positive changes in the near future. But we will, uh, that's exactly why we want to keep writing about it, because it deserves attention.